Hello, welcome to this episode of The Martial Truth. Um, in this episode, I'll be interviewing uh, Sensei Russ Smith, um, the author of three books, Principle Driven Skill Development in Traditional Martial Arts. Outstanding book, highly recommend it. Um, great for beginning instructors and even instructors that are teaching a long time. A lot of stuff in this book. Really, really excellent. I enjoyed it tremendously. All right. Um, also, Overview of Fujian Taizu Boxing, okay, which I, again, out of the three of these books, this is my favorite, really, really liked it, okay, like a mini bubishi, that's what I'll refer to it as, and then this one I really enjoyed also, um, which is five, Fujian, uh, Fujian, excuse me, Fujian Five Ants Assist Boxing, um, a student manual, but it has a lot of really cool information in it, and uh, it's very good, all right, so those are the current three books that uh, he's written, um, we'll talk about all three, um, it's going to be a wide-ranging interview. I mean, we're all over the place. Hopefully, you'll enjoy it. I'm, I'm putting the full interview up, so it's a little long, but um, I think it's interesting. Uh, I enjoy talking with Russ a lot. We know each other a long time. Um, he's a Gojiru practitioner, obviously five ancestor fists. He's done uh, Filipino martial arts. We're both students of Mariyoshi Kobudo under Gakia Yoshiaki Sensei, um, you know, Everything you can think of comes up. Self-defense, um, firearms, weapons training, principles, how to teach, you name it. It's a wide-ranging interview. Um, I'll put links to the books in the description. Highly recommend, highly, highly recommend you pick up a copy. All right. Um, again, as instructors, we can always use more things to help us think about how to teach well and how to teach better than we are right now. All right. So, uh, as always, please share the podcast, please smash that like button helps with the YouTube algorithm. Consider becoming a monthly member, all right? It's a very low price for members only contact content, including this podcast, which you get commercial free. All right. Um, and, uh, without further ado, my interview with Russ Smith. So I did read all three books. Oh, awesome. That's why it took a while. Um, awesome. You know, um, Thank you. My well. favorite one was, uh, believe it or not, you know, um, this one. Awesome. Awesome. I had a feeling, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a really special book, right? Like, it doesn't it remind you of the Bubishi? That's exactly what I've been describing it to. So I had them on awesome. my desk yesterday, and when my students were coming in, they hadn't seen those books because they were out in my house. Sure, sure. But now that I finished them, I brought them out to put them in the... Uh, bookcases here in the dojo so they were the one student that studies tai chi with me she's 71 she picked it up right away and i said to her i said they're all good books i said i really like this one and i showed and i showed i had an, uh, another uh, there's an ishinru guy that trains with me who's godan and he started with someone else but when he heard i was out here he came on a saturday and decided to you know, start training and he was looking at it too. So I think a couple of people took photos of the cover. So hopefully a couple Ooh. of my own people will buy it. Why don't you tell me why, why you decided to write the principal driven skill development book? Yeah. Yeah. So that book, you know, <laughs> there was a, there was a time in my early training where I decided I wanted to teach. And so, you know, my, my experience in teaching was I was told by everybody, hey, you've been training a long time, you should teach. And the, the common, the common yeah. um, advice that you get, right? Yeah. Everybody's like, well, you learn from teaching. And while that's true, I absolutely think it's a horror to take uh, somebody who's not experienced in teaching and have them teach people because those poor students, right? And I subjected my son to this. You know, my early students all dealt with the old school me, which was like, bust ass, train hard, don't ask questions, just do the shit. And in 20 years, you're going to understand it because that's what I was told, right? So very old school style of approach. And when I when I started having a student who started asking me a ton of questions and I couldn't shut him down because he was a super close friend of mine, everything changed. I was like, oh shit, I can't, I can't bullshit this guy. Right. I got nothing. I can't tell him no. I'm not going to answer his questions. I had to, I realized all these gaps in my knowledge and these, these, leaps of faith I had taken that I didn't realize I had taken. 
So they were, they represented these gaps that I didn't even really know I had until I was being pressed for answers. And so it really started me down this path of trying to understand what I was missing because my thought about joining a traditional martial art as opposed to a modern boxing, MMA, these kinds of things was these old guys back here, they all figured this stuff out. They like when the stuff was needed more than it is in modern times where we're so safe now, um, these guys battle tested this stuff. They passed down the goods. All the secrets are there. It's just up to us to, to earn the secrets. Right. But I was training in, I was training in one of the largest goji groups in the world. And the bunkai was absolute crap that would get you killed on the street. And I just couldn't reconcile these things. And of course, you, you've experienced some of this. Many people that we talk to have, but also like um, just the, the, the problem as it unfolds, as you realize kind of the emperor has no clothes in some places and, and you try to make sense of that. And so what I did was I started looking outside and, you know, I've been on the internet. I've been, my, my career has been in the internet since the internet's been a public utility and I've been involved in in talking to people across the world about martial arts for a long time and and attempting to do the research that I could with my limited capabilities and funds and those kinds of things. So um, I learned about White Crane and principle-driven approach from White Crane. And I spent a lot of time and I did some study and travel and and learning about that. And it really got me to the point where I realized you don't have to come at this from a place of zero understanding and eventual revealed knowledge which may never show up which really frustrated me because i was exposed to the idea of shuhari as the stages of learning right. but what i realized was almost no okinawans were going to in my experience my teachers again this is all my experience so luckily some other people have not had to deal with this they've much much better experiences than me, but I have found a lot of people who've had very similar experiences. Well, so, I, I, let me, let me just tell you. So, so for ahead. myself, right. I mean, I started in 79 and I was one of these guys that right off the bat, I was totally into it. I really oh, yeah. felt like I found my calling. Right. Yeah. But, you know, I'd ask a question and I'd get the same kind of response. I think you got, which was, we'll go practice more. Right. Okay, 20, well, more, 20 I, I will, years, you'll figure it out. Right, I will, I, you know, how, how can I hit harder? You know, I'm 15 years old. How, how can I hit the heavy bag how, harder? Well, you just got to hit it. Oh, okay, well, I am hitting it, but is there like, you know, is there anything I could do? And, and I, I kind of got blank looks and just told to practice. Right. And eventually you'll get it. And, you know, I firmly believe that some people do get it that way. Like they train crazy hard. And they finally come to a realization, but you know, but it's I, haphazard. It's right, haphazard. And, well, and also it's like, maybe it's not right. a definite, like there's no, so where's the method to like teaching someone, okay, this is how you use your body, right? This is what, yeah. this is the, this is how you have to manipulate the body to generate this power, to generate this speed, to accomplish this. Right. Yeah. And yeah. It, yeah, it didn't exist in my early training either. And I found it initially, um, believe it or not, with a senior Gojiru sensei who was a big oh, believer in the following of the Bubishi, right? But honestly, he could he could talk about the concepts, but I didn't see those concepts in his body. Mm -hmm. So then I met Chen Zhanghua from from Chen Style Taiji Chan Practical Method, and you know they, they have the method, practical method, right? Right, right. And then he started teaching like this. He'd, he'd explain a principle and he'd say, okay, so this is the principle. Yeah. If you see me violating this principle, maybe I'm having a bad day or I'm just screwing up. So don't do what I'm doing. You know the principle. Now. That was like literally like a lightning bolt. Yeah. And yeah. There, was, there was one time I vividly remember where he's doing something and I'm like, and this is after a few years. And I, so on a break, I said to him, I said, Shifu, it looked like you were doing this. And he goes, did it? And I said, yeah. It, and he goes, well, if I was, you know, you shouldn't do it like that. So again, this is a few years later after initially yeah. introducing this concept. Yeah. And again, he's telling me, listen, I, I can make a mistake. I can maybe start to forget something myself. 
but you know the principle. So you have to make sure that doesn't happen to you. You have to try to. And so I get 100% where you're coming from because I had the same experience. Yeah. And then same thing with uh, Lu Changi and feeding crane. You know, when I first met him, he asked me a question that, I mean, I thought about it myself, which was, we know karate had this power. What happened? What happened? Right. Like right. literally, like not not like knocking karate, like basically saying, listen, yeah. we know karate had it. Yeah. What what do you think happened? And I told him two things. I said, I think the biggest one is the advent of sport and the emphasis on sport. And the other one was that, you know, World War II, we lost a lot of the very mm -hmm. senior karate sensei. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a huge loss. But I really believe sport. Once you once you are not doing it where you have to concern with protecting yourself for real and just you're trying to look good for someone else's opinion. I think a lot of the body mechanics and things that like guys like me and you are interested in mm -hmm. don't matter. Right. Yeah. You know, and that's why reading the book, you know, for me, it was, uh, it was good because there was some things I got from a different angle. Yep. But a lot of the book was, you know, basically me as I'm reading it, nodding my head. Yeah. Yeah. Like, good. And, yep. you know, and I said, I would expect I, that. Yeah. And, and I, I've told people, you know, and I'll mention it here again. I've, I've said to some of my own senior guys, um, I said to them, I said, it's a book that every beginning instructor mm -hmm. should mm -hmm. read. Nice. Like nice. I, I, you know, like if I was going to write the same type of and book, that's, that's this book. That's that yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll hold awesome. it up too. I have them here Thanks. on my, I have them here on my desk with me. But again, like I said, uh, yeah. Yeah, this book, you know, if you're yeah, just starting you. out teaching or if you've been teaching a long time and you feel maybe you need something to kind of maybe maybe make you think give you some structure more, or and, give you some more structure. right? And also just expand the mind like maybe you're, you know, look, instructors, and I'm sure you've experienced the same thing where you, maybe you get a little stale a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. and you need something to kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, and I find like even like the boxing manual, right? You know, yeah. which is, you yeah. know, which is, you know, this one, yeah. right? Yeah. Just, yeah. you know, this book, the way it's formatted is great. It's got cool. a couple of lines up top and yeah. then it's got a brief explanation. Yeah. But again, you know, I, uh, I asked Chen Zhanghua one time to translate the uh, eight poems of the fist. Kempo yep. Kukui, right? Yeah. And, you know, I'd heard a lot of Ishinru guys wax poetic on this, right? Yeah. And his explanations were very brief and very clear. Right. I literally said to him at the end, I said, that's it? And his response to me was, he says, it's my experience that the ancients wrote these very, these one line thing. Yeah. And they were like, you, you read it and you were like, hmm. And he says, it's your job to figure it out. He says, so they're giving you a clue. Now mm -hmm. you have to, you know, you have to connect that clue to to what it is you think sure. that means and figure it out. And I, right. I felt reading the the overview of Fujian Taizu boxing was was the same kind of thing. Like you said, it's like a mini bubishi. Like yeah. I I love those small manuals that yeah that have yeah. all this you know you know knowledge and you know better than like a you know a how to book or you know yeah. like it's just yeah it's those yeah. things you can bring in and you can really expand on in your classes and do different things with it right yeah so, yeah. Um, yeah but i thought the the principle driven book if you're a beginning instructor i mean if i had had that book and i show, oh, sure yeah. you think, i know you wrote it but i'm sure your thinking is if 100 percent, right if, if when you started teaching if you had saw that a book like that on a shelf and you had read it yeah well, this is what I expected to be taught. Right. This was what right. I thought should have been right. in the teaching from day one. Right. And I just, it was never forthcoming. Right. Or, you know, and I'll, I'll say this though, in hindsight, as I get older, I can look back and blame myself for some things that oh, I used course. to blame my teachers for. Of course. I can say, you know, it's sometimes I should have taken better notes. Sometimes I should have listened better right. because over time I've come to realize some of these things were some things my teachers tried to explain to me. Of course. However, I wasn't ready. I didn't understand their way of right. describing it. So I have to, I have to um in some way give my teachers credit while at the same time say I really feel like a tremendous amount of the failures attributed to traditional martial arts are actually failures attributable solely to bad teaching methods. 
I think the arts contain these 100%. things, contained them in different ways and different times. And I think either teachers were too stingy, they didn't understand, they didn't force pressure testing, they assumed the student would take on the burdens of these things. So for me, to help students um, progressively and assisting them, not through the Confucian model where I push all the responsibility on them, right. but to share the responsibility, I think that... Um, the best thing that I get out of it is when a student makes a mistake in school now, whether it's Kung Fu or Karate or Kobodo or whatever, I say, okay, what were you missing? And they look over on the board, the list of principles, and they go, oh, strong right. versus weak. Hold on. Let me try it again. Right. And they self-correct. Right. And that, and then if you all you have is a checklist or something poetic, it's easier to remember the checklist items and go, oh, what did I forget? Oh, advancing and retreating has to have the hands and the feet together. Oh yeah, the the Kempo Haku told me that. Right, right, right. But right. I didn't do it, so I need to fix that. So it's interesting when I, uh, you know, I left the school in New York, and I told them two years ahead of time. I said I'm let. I got all the black belts together. I said I'm letting you guys know now. I'm moving to Arizona, and I said this is not, this is not a drill. This is happening. This, this happening. This is happening. So make a decision. Decide what you guys want to do. I mean, you know, I'm not going to be here. So decide. There's a few ways we can do it, but none of them include me staying. Right. So <laughs> so the one guy, Jimmy Waller, said, I'd, I'd like to try it. And he wasn't the most senior guy, but he's right. with me a long time. But the the senior guys, I knew most of them weren't going anywhere. So uh, so interesting, though. Um, I leave about four or five months after I'm gone. A couple of black belts I talk to on a regular basis. And the one guy I talk to says to me, you know, Sensei, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I think you leaving was a good thing, right? And I said, and I and I knew why. And I said, yeah. but why, John? Why? And he goes, well, you know, when you were in the room, if we had a question, we just walked over to you and you just gave us the answer. But now, if we're looking for you in the room, you're not there. And now we look at each other and go, okay, we got to figure it out. Yeah. And the way they figure it out is through the principle-based approach I gave them, right? And, you know, so now, you know, when I go back, I'm seeing steady improvement, right? And yeah. I think in a w way it was good for them because it forced them to mm -hmm. take a hard look at that and yeah. use that as their basis for learning as yeah. opposed to relying on me, you know? Yeah. And it's yeah. one of the things I see with a lot of people, you know, um, in the different arts I teach and study is that um, they want to rely on the teacher so much instead of taking a step back and saying, okay, well, my teacher's not me. My teacher's body's not like mine, right? His brain isn't like mine. Like I've got to figure this out for me. And yeah. again, if you take a principle-based approach, then that's very possible. You're but giving if, them the tools to succeed. Right. But if you, if you mimic Right. All you do is mimic and mimic is fine for the first few years. You know, like I tell people all the time, you know, if you can get your Ishinru karate to the point, you know, where you look like me, that's pretty good. However, I want you to get your Ishinru karate to the point where you look like you doing really good Ishinru karate. Nice. Right. And that's yeah. whatever art. Right. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, one of my favorite sayings in the last few years is principles over personalities. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yep. And, you know, it's, you see it all the time, you know, you yeah. see where people are attracted to a particular teacher because right. he's funny. Sure. Sure. They like the guy, you know, yeah. and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's like, nothing wrong with that. That can't be the cornerstone on which no. it all rests. No, because you don't, you don't last and right. you, you come to a, you come to a, a, an eventual place where you realize, okay, well, shouldn't I be learning more? Like, I don't know about you, but when I made black belt, right. I was told the whole time that, well, when, when you make black belt, you really start to learn. Mm -hmm. That's what everybody says, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I made black belt and I wasn't being taught anything. Like right. I was like, okay, well, if you're a sixth degree or a seventh degree and I'm this pissant first degree, right? All right. Well, okay. So what's the next level I'm of curriculum? I'm ready now. Let's go. And there was and the answer. And the answer is, oh, there's another kata. Yeah. Yeah. Another kata. That's it. That's right. Right. Yeah. So like, even when I first went to Okinawa and I trained with Master Shimabuku, I did Seisan 
And when I finished, he said to me, why are you doing it like a white belt? I was a second degree black belt. And I looked at him and I was like, uh, I don't even, I don't even know what he meant. Yeah. And then he started I'm just doing what I was told. Isn't right. that right? <laughs> and then he started showing me and, you know, told me, don't stack the hands. Like you're a black belt. No, just move into it. Do like this and do like that. And that's what I realized. So, you know, like for beginners, I obviously I teach the, the Strip reference way. point karate. Yeah. But then Classical once they make timing. Yeah. Once they make black belt, I start showing them and changing things. And like, yeah. that's when their eyes go like this. Well, wait a second. Like, you know, right. I'm like, well, yeah, but you had to get to this point. You Now you have the foundation. Now we're going to show you how to move freely. Now we're going to show you how to do things that a lot of other people in Ishinu don't do because they don't yeah. know it. They're still yeah. stuck in that that original first year. doing it. First yeah. year training, yeah. yeah. And I'm sure it's the same thing in, you see in Goju. Oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah, Matayoshi Kobudo too. I mean. Oh, totally. <laughs> you know, now, now like with Matayoshi Kobudo, I mean, it's a mess. Yeah. Well, I teach Matayoshi Kobudo and I teach uh, – extending the weapon quite early and people right. are like that's Mario Shikobodo and like yeah. of course it is you aren't meant to stay one thirds for your whole life like th that's yes learn that but we've got to progress beyond that and, and know the alternatives and I don't know about you but I find students have a bit of a challenge with this model because when they ask a question the answer isn't straightforward do x right the right. answer is do x here do y here do z here and it's a little challenging for students, but if you get them into the culture of learning and I call it owning their own study, owning right. their own training, you've got to somewhere get them, cut the cut the apron strings, kick them out of the nest in some way and say, look, I've given you this and this, you've got to develop from here. This is your, your preference. Now, understanding that the principles, some of them are kind of immutable. Some of them are really preference-based. Right. So are you more of a kicker, more of a striker, more of a right. grappler? Right. There are principles that speak to those different preferences. And that's why we have different styles because of different preferences. Right. But the human body is the same. Conflict is the same. And it is true. People have, especially Westerners, they have a hard time with variations. Yeah. So they, they, they like, you know, and, well, you know, some people will say to me, well, why don't you show it this way right off the bat? And, you yeah. know, my response is, if I show it this way to you right off the bat, you're going to be all over the place. You're not going to learn a specific yeah. way to move the body. And eventually, once you get proficient at that more basic way of moving the body, now you have the foundation. Now you have the structure. Now you should be able to move freely. And, you know, I, oh, I'm and, sorry. No, no, go ahead. You know, um, in the Bunkai craze 10, 15 years ago, let's say, maybe maybe more by now, um, as I get older, I'm like, that was just two years ago. Yeah, it was really no. 25, right? So <laughs> yeah. I'm horrible yeah. at this. Yeah. Uh, so anyhow, um, during the Bunkai craze, one of the challenges, because I was deeply inculcated in it too, oh, right? I was like, course. oh, right. I, you turn his head right. this way and you poke him in the eye and that's the Bunkai for picking your nose, right? Like it was, we were all crazy with right. this Bunkai craze. And um, one of the things I love about principles is it reigns it in in a focused way. Right. It it doesn't say the world is your oyster. It says based on your preferences and capabilities, these are the choices you should limit yourself to because too many options is daunting. You're never going to do the Rolodex fast enough in the moment you need it if you just go hog wild. So I, you know, at going through all these wasteful phases in my training career, um, that was one of them. And then for me, principle driven has really helped me identify the 12 or 15 things that really matter the most and well, the 10 other things that are preferences. And so then I can understand the core and the fringes clearly, and I can see any other art now and put it in good context. And so I tell my students, I say, Hey, look, I've done a lot of cross training. I, I will never stop you or recommend or frown on you cross training, but I hope through my better teaching, you'll need less of it. Do it because you love it, right? But don't. I hope I do a better job, and you don't need it like I needed it. Yeah, I um, you know, so with the whole bunkai thing, what started waking me up was, you know, I became a police officer. Yeah, and I, you know, like, just to give you an idea, I just saw an article in New York where last month in the whole New York City transit system, because originally I was a New York City transit police officer, right? right. The whole transit system, they said there was about 146 felony crimes. 
system wide. So that's right. like 10 or 11 precincts. And uh, when I got on, my command alone did 400 felony crimes a month. So this will give you an idea of how how dangerous it was. So I'm not I'm not kidding you. There were nights where I had three fights. Did, did crime increase that much, or was it was it enforcement got better? Or no, both? it was crime increased, and then they decided, which eventually they'll decide again in New York, yeah, yeah, to yeah. Uh, crack the whip, yep, make yep. their their have be repercussions for for these criminals. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we were basically told to go out and lock everybody up. And and we got a handle on it and crime went down and New York became a great place. Now it's a dump again. But, you know, it's but my my thing was from a martial arts standpoint, you know, I got on the job and, you know, I, I had a, like in the dojo, nobody could do joint locks like me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the first time I went to do a joint lock, it didn't work the way I wanted it to work. So, you know, again. I, I took a step back and I said to myself, well, it can't be this technique because this technique is found in every friggin' martial art across every culture. It's got to be the way I'm doing the technique. So I went back into the dojo. I took a couple of my harder core students, you know, and this is going way back. I'm like 24 years old and I'm, we're like, I'm like, okay, so this didn't work and there's got to be a reason this didn't work. And we worked on it and, you know, I came to a conclusion. I thought that I figured out what the issue was. And then from that point on, every time I used that technique in actual combat, it worked. Now, it might not have worked the same way each time, which that's in combat. That's just the way it goes. That, right? right. Yeah. But, but no two punches are ever the same. Yeah. And the, the thing was for me, being in all those fights, and I was in hundreds of fights, right, really changed my martial arts. And then we had a situation in the dojo. We, we had, you know, six to 10 police officers training. Mm -hmm. So a guy would walk in and go, listen, last night this happened. And this is what I did. It was okay, but I, you know, and then we would literally dissect it. So, so for like 10, 15 years running awesome. in the dojo, it was a combat, it was a combat laboratory. Yeah. And, you know, and then what are we doing? We're looking at the kata. Okay. So where are the answers? Are they in the kata? Oh yeah, they are in the kata. Well, the answers here are the answers there, you know, but you can only understand that in the kata when you know something about fighting, right? Right. It doesn't, it doesn't come from you practice the kata to, I, I was told by one of my teachers, practice the kata until the kata does you when you need it. It's just going to show up. And I don't, no, it's have not. That kind of, I, I know no, it's I, not, I don't have that kind of faith. So I, you know, unfortunately no, it's, it's not going to show up. I right. Know, I know. I mean, the thing, in some rare cases you'll yeah, get good, well, you get good course. value, right. but it's not, but it's, you know, 20% efficient compared to like starting from the other side. Right. And, you know, the thing is, you talk about teaching, like even now when I teach, you know, I'll I'll take a move because it's true in the Chinese arts. The Chinese arts don't have one application for a move. Right. right. I mean, they have multiple like man, right. like Chen Zhanghua, my Tai Chi master says all the yeah. time, if you don't have a vivid imagination, you cannot reach high levels of martial art. Mm -hmm. So I tell people like my guys in New York, listen, come up with as many bunkai, as many applications as you can. And you're going to find there's some that are great for you. But. The reason you have to come up with a lot is there's 25, 30 people in the room mm. and the ones you like are not going to work. You know, I'm five, seven, right? Yeah, the man. guy that's six, five, the ones I like, maybe don't yeah. work for him. He might need one of these other ones I figure yeah. out that I don't yeah. even like, Yeah, but I'm going to show know, him anyway. You know, you know, in, in the book, the way I try to address this is through the, the, the term I call stretching. And the reason I put stretching in there was the idea that minor variations have to be expected. What I find frustrating is um, some kata bunkai purists who say, you have to do the move exactly as in the kata, forgetting the fact that there's a hundred fucking variations of this technique across lineages, that there is no one right way to do the kata movement. But the idea that, that you have to do the movement unvariant in to make it work as a bunkai. And I just find that to be absolutely unworkable in reality. So for me to understand a process of using kata, I have to use the Chinese approach. The, for me, the Okinawan and Japanese approach to understanding and using kata for value, I can't actually use the Okinawan model that way, hardly at all. Yeah, I a um, couple of things I've experienced. I go into an Ishinu Dojo, I'm going to teach a seminar. Normally the first day I work with the instructor. If he decides to invite a couple of his Senior oh, guy. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But normally we're about an hour in, sometimes less. And the guy says to me, 
I've trained with all these guys and no one's ever showed me anything like this. Yeah. yeah. And he goes, I, I just don't understand. Like I said, well, they can't show you what they don't know. And I think a lot of guys, again, they just are stuck in the same pattern. Well, my instructor said, do it like this. So they do it like that. And this becomes, this becomes a thing that makes them, it's like the record that's stuck. The needle doesn't yeah. move forward. Right. Yeah. And they just keep repeating the same thing, making the same mistakes. You know, like I said to a friend of mine who's a senior Shotokan sensei, I said to him, you know, with all due respect, I don't have anything against Shotokan, but here's what I have a problem with. All you guys, as you get older, are getting hip and knees, knee replacements. Yes. I said, so when are six senior Shotokan guys going to look at each other and say, hey, maybe we need to talk about changing the way we train to prevent these injuries that we're all getting? Maybe don't plant the foot and then rotate the femur to stretch the ACL. And, and he looked at me and he said to me, he's older, he's 73. And he said to me, he says, you know, you're right. He said, but I don't know that's going to happen. I said, right, right, there's the problem, right? And, you know, it's it's the same thing. Like, right now, like, you know Sensei Yogi. Oh, yes. So I asked him Huge in Okinawa. respect. Huge I respect. asked him in Okinawa 10 years ago. I said to him, I said, Sensei, um, you know, how has Okinawan karate changed from when you started it? And he, his response was, I was taught that when I put my hand on the, the door handle to leave my house, I had to be ready. That's mm -hmm. when he started his training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, but now in Okinawa, they've painted themselves into a box and that box is tournament. Mm -hmm. And he says, a guy like me who doesn't do tournaments, he says, my karate is considered not good. He says, but if, if you're a tournament guy and you bring your students to tournaments and your students do well, well, your karate is considered good. But again, that's not karate's original intent. And, you know, I feel the same way, right? Yeah. That, you know, one of the one of the ways that I've dealt with this problem, because I mean, you're pointing to this lack of ability to move out of a mindset, right? right? So once you adopt what you believe to be tradition, you have one version of a tradition because there are a million traditions, many right. of which are incompatible. Um, but you paint yourself into this tradition and you lock yourself into a mindset that says this tradition doesn't allow me to have friends outside the tradition, doesn't allow me to cross train, doesn't allow me to experiment, doesn't allow me to pressure test, doesn't allow me to spar, doesn't allow me to do X, Y, and Z. My belt is a religious object. My uniform is a, you know, to like all these weird quasi-religious things that get jammed into somebody's Western misunderstanding of an Eastern tradition. And, and then there becomes this lack of ability to understand what a living tradition looks like. And a living tradition, especially at our age and our position where we are helping to ensure the future, uh, you know, uh, not not necessarily success, but the survival right. of some of these traditions that some of which do rely on us. They're practiced by very few people. Um, you know, we have to understand what a living tradition can and should look like. And then when you study history and then understand so-and-so said this, but they did something different, but the culture says they couldn't s admit to it. Then you go, oh, that's what a living tradition means over there. Now, a living tradition over here can mean something slightly different. And so for me, uh, over the course of my evolution of understanding was, so for instance, one of my teachers, I could tell he admitted to certain changes in the way he taught. And and so I, uh, in in reading between the lines, what I understood what he was saying was, was there's a certain piece of the training that is the content, and there's a certain piece of the training, which is the delivery vehicle. And if you can separate the rocket body with all the fuel from the payload, which is this big, then you can kind of separate the idea that training methodology can and should be evolving in, a, in the moment. When you have a student who doesn't understand something, when you have a student with a different background or an injury or anything, or, or they're just not getting the main way you normally give the lesson, that's, if you fail to reach them, you're failing as a teacher. And so when you can take your place and understand that as a teacher and go, oh, a living tradition means I keep the kata, I don't necessarily change the kata, but I help them understand the kata. I keep the techniques as they were, but I help them train them in better ways so that they hit stuff and not just the air, that they develop some fluidity, that they develop their own combinations and they shadow box, 
that they develop real life skills, not just memorization. They they move beyond memorization to skill development. To me, that was like the big breakthrough for me was understanding you could separate them. And so for many, many people in traditional martial arts, the teaching methodology is indistinguishable from the content. And those are people that are locked in old paradigms that they cannot shake. So I had, we had a woman who had been in a very bad car accident in Ireland. She spent like six months in Ireland. I was very young. I was like a showdown. So I'm maybe 19 years old or whatever. And I'm watching this older black belt. She's doing the final move in Chinto. And in Ishinru Chinto, the final move, you drop to one knee and punch. She can't stand back up. She can get yeah. down to the, on the knee. She can't stand back up. I watched right. this guy yell at her for two minutes telling her, well, you've got to just be able to do it. You, this is how it's done, right? And I'm I'm like yeah. standing there, right? So he walks away in a huff and I walk over to her and I drop down on one knee and I said to her, take your forward foot and now pull it back closer to your knee. And she does it. And I said, now try standing up. And she stood right up and she looked at me and I looked at her and she looked at me and she goes, I can do that. I said, why can't you do it? You I have said, to do it. You have to, right. Like, <laughs> and yeah. I use that as a story in my, when I teach because of, yeah. of being stuck in that yeah. mindset we're talking about here. Yeah. yeah. Where no, 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 it's got to be exactly like this. Oh yeah. But okay. But I, I, I have knee replacement now. Like it, yeah. what doesn't matter. You still have to do it like that. Cause my teacher said it had, it was done like that instead of, it being adjusted for every individual. And, you know, and I'll give you another story relating it to Bunkai. I know for a fact that when the Marines were studying with Tatsu Shimabuku in Okinawa, that they'd go up to him. Like, let's say a Marine went up to him in, the, in one class and said, hey, Sensei, you know, how do I use this move in the kata in a fight? And Tatsuo would show him something. Or, or he would say to Sensei, could I do this? And he'd go, yeah. Joto, Joto, good, right? Okay. Now the next day, another Marine would come up and the same exact move, he would show the founder a different application. He said, Sensei, could I do the, this, use this move like this in a fight? And Tatsu would go, Joto, Joto. Now those two guys, 30 years later, are in a room together at, this, at a seminar <laughs> and they're going- Proclaiming they're, their truth. I'm literally watching them argue. Yeah. Argue. No, no. Tatsuo told me it's done like this. No, no, Tatsuo told me it's done like this. And even some of them, like if you were there, if you were an early student of his and you learned Tokumini no Kun before he studied with Taira Shin Ken Sensei, you learn the Keon version. So the opening is different. And I have him on video doing it that way. So there are some early students where I literally would see them argue with a guy who was there maybe a year later and he's going, no, 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 that's that's how he showed me. And they're like, no, 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 he showed it to me like this, not realizing, okay, guys, you're both right. Like, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. and this is what I mean about that, yeah. that mentality of being stuck and not yeah. being able to really take a step back and say, you know, and, yeah. you know, that's what I found with a lot of the first generation guys that study with Tatsuo, you know, they, they all think their way yeah. is the exact way that he taught. Yeah. Meanwhile, he might have showed them a certain way because that guy was six two. The other guy was, you know, five yeah. seven, you know. Yeah. And yeah. and again with the language barrier, which I'm sure you realize now too, totally. was a huge, huge limiter, huge detriment to really yeah. understanding what's going on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you know, like in my case, Chen Zhanghua speaks perfect English. Okay. He was a history teacher in Canada. Okay. Oh, so, cool. Right. Yeah. Kichiro, Kichiro Shimabuku speaks English. My, my, my karate sensei in Okinawa. So, you know, it's, it's a big help when you can communicate that way. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. And like, you know, training with Gakia, I mean, he got, the, yeah. he got the principles across. Right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, and my, my Japanese wasn't that great in his mine, English. Yeah. Wasn't mine isn't either. Right. But when you teach from a foundation of structure, how, how much easier is that? Cause everything comes with the test. So I, I love that. And and I think that's another great way to think about teaching is, and you talked about, you, you hinted at this in something you said earlier, which is there are various ways to teach. And one of them is a kind of a test first methodology 
where you don't present the student with an answer and then tell them what question they're they're going to come up with. Uh, you give them the question and you help. Now, it takes more time and it's more like the Socratic method. But when you present them with the problem and you help guide them through the solution, it's very lasting. It's very valuable. It's very powerful methodology. Well, that's what's going on in New York now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. leaving like what's going to happen? I mean, you know, right. Because, you know, I built something for which I didn't even realize. I literally got a letter last week in the mail from Kichiro Shimabuku in Okinawa. And yeah. I was like, mm, why is he sending me a letter? He was congratulating me on the 40th anniversary of my dojo. Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. It's funny, but I didn't know it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't know it was the 40th anniversary. Oh, right. <laughs> but here, he, he yeah, yeah, it was great. Right. Yeah. But again, you know, you build this thing and then you leave it and you put, you give it to somebody else. Right. And you're yeah. curious to see, well, what's going to happen. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it turns out now it's been, you know, four years almost and it's thriving. It's doing well. Well, right? that's a testament to your leadership as well. So, yeah, yeah, and, right. and it's a testament to those guys follow yeah. a, a, a principle driven method. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as opposed to just, you know, well, 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 Sensei Calandra said, do it like this. You know, I, I'll go a little um, metaphorical on this. I think, I think a the strict method is hard, and the uh, you know no structured method is too soft, right? So I think, like uh, like one of the, you might even find this. I don't know if the saying is in here or not. I forget, but there's a saying in Five Ancestor Boxing that says, "Too hard, uh, like a uh, teeth are." hard but brittle easy to break the tongue is soft but lasts until you're old right. i read i read it the other day so I yeah i, I remember I that right i love those right. things so right. i think i think the idea of um something in the middle something that is both hard and soft right it has enough structure to help but flexibility to be workable for under different circumstances yeah right. yeah and uh so what's the, what's your plan for the future Oh yeah, my plan Are you for the planning future, on writing more books. So what's the story? I am, I am. So yeah, so this book, the the main feedback I got, all great feedback on this one. But the feedback I got that was even remotely negative was this. Um, okay, so how? What do I do with it? Like this was conceptual in nature. It was not curriculum based. Right. And so what I'm doing now is I'm taking these things that I've developed for my school, and I'm putting them to paper for other people. So right now I've got four volumes in the works okay. together. One is in collaboration with Sensei Davila. One is Takedowns 101. Okay. It's all about the difference between footwork and stances, why and how they matter and how to affect takedowns in a very style agnostic way, in a very powerful way uh, to develop Kazushi in all your movements. Um, the second is Bridging 101. And that's arm-based work. It's Ukewaza developed on the outside gate. Bridging 201 is Ukewaza on the inside gate, where it's much more dangerous. And then lastly, it's uh, the Burinkan teaching methodology. So it's essentially like a, a summary of all the skills and lessons I would give to my other assistant instructors. So those are four volumes I hope to have out this year. They're all going to be smaller and cheaper than the original book, but they're all based on curriculum. So, so many drills and what are in there. I, I love this concept. I saw it in another book. There's QR codes. So you can, you can right. read about the drill. You can watch the drill. Right. And Andre, can, Andres Quas new book is like that. Yeah. I heard that. I, I yeah. still have to pick up a copy. Yeah. Of that. I, ha I have it. I'm actually reading that right now. And uh, he's going to, I'm going to be interviewing him in a couple of weeks. Um, awesome. That ought to be pretty, guy. that ought to be pretty interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the, um, so how do you go about doing the books? Yeah. So I had originally had the help of a great friend and teacher of mine, uh, Sifu Mark Wiley. He had a, a publishing company, Tambuli Media. He gave me a ton of advice, um, hooked me up with an editor and a layout artist. Um, but as he got very, very busy, um, I needed to take on that project myself. So he handed the rights back to me. I published the second edition on my own. I learned how to do the book editing myself. I learned how to use Amazon publishing uh, techniques, get my own, own ISBN numbers, and Library of Congress stuff. So I actually do all the um, uh, writing, layout, editing, and publishing all myself now. So is there an app you use or are you using this? Yeah, 
I use an app. I don't use the Adobe app because it's very it's very expensive. I use a tool called Affinity Publisher. It's less than $100 for a lifetime okay. subscription. Excellent tool. If you or anybody else is interested, I can point you to that. Yeah, I've been. It's, it's I'm, not I'm that getting, hard to use. I'm getting harassed. Uh, good, good, because I would say I think our generation needs to do a hell of a lot better. So, so I'll just tell you, like, um, you know, years ago I was in Okinawa and I was driving around with Master Shimabuku, and I said to him, "This is in '97." I said, "Sensei, you have to make videos, right?" Yes. Yeah. And he said, "No." And I looked at him and I said, "What do you mean, no?" I can be very frank with him, right? So I said, "What do you mean, no?" He goes. No. I said, Sensei, you've got to make videos. Like, we, yeah. you have to make videos. He's like, no. There is enough old men on video doing Ishinru karate. And, you know, that that hit me, right? And I was like... That's a thing. You no, know, that's kind of... A, he's got a point, right? So he looked at me and he said, you make them. And I looked at him and I said, me? He said, yeah, you do it. So I, I had a couple, there were a couple of my students in the van. I turned and looked at them and they call like struck their shoulders like this, right? And I said, well, sensei, if I do it though, I, I'm going to do like my fighting techniques, you know? And I, you know, I made them now, they're 25 years old, 30 years old. I made them, but he says, no, it's okay. So I did the first one and I sent it to him and I called him. I said, did you get the DVD? Because back then it was DVDs, right? And he said, mm -hmm. he said, yeah. I said, so what'd you think? He says, oh, it was wonderful. He says, it's Stroh's Ishinru, so powerful. The fighting techniques are great. I said, yeah, no sensei, but it's kind of like more my type of fighting techniques. It's not like, and he goes, no, no, it's great. You make more, keep doing. So, I, you know, I release it. And, you know, a couple of first generation guys said to me, that's not Ishinru, that's Kalandru. But the headmaster has the complete opposite feeling. The headmaster says, no, no, this is great. He yeah. says, you keep, you do more. Yeah. And, you know, so I did those to start and then, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, but people have been asking for a book and I like the idea of doing the book with a QR code where it could go and you could oh, see yeah. applications, you could see, you know, yeah. and, you know, again, I could see where it would have to be a small pamphlet, you know, like a manuals kind of like mm -hmm. you're doing with each one with uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, each individual Ishin Rukata. Because it, you know, I just, I just think a lot of these Okinawan arts are kind of stuck. Yeah. yeah like yeah. there's, there's no, you know, there's some guys, but like even certain guys in Okinawa who people think they're bunk eye are fantastic. Like a guy like me looks at it and goes, yeah, it's, it's okay, but maybe it's, <laughs> it's still not realistic. It's some, yeah. and again, not all bunk eye has to be realistic. You could just do it as a, you know, as a training thing to get you to move a certain way and, and, and think sure. about certain things. Sure. But, you know, like you talked about the inside the gate. Yeah. Like I can tell you from being in a lot of combat, like the key is being able to move straight down the center line. If well, you, that's the fact. If you, if you have skill, it's the fastest way to end a fight. If you don't, you better chase on the outside gate. And, you know, one, one of the things I talk about is, and this is something that's not talked about enough by instructors. And frankly, because unless you've been in a lot of fights, you're not going to know it. Like you're just not. Right. Yeah. Cause you're not, you're not going to get this type of reaction in the dojo because your students in the dojo know something's coming. No well, matter how much you think they don't, they know something's coming. They know you're going to do something. Right? Yeah. And very few people in Okinawa and karate across the board train against multiple punches on a regular basis. It is almost always singular punches. So super important to learn how to shut down that second hand before it becomes a problem. Yeah, and we do, we do like, um, you know, so like I, I can tell you that, you know, like predators who attack you when they throw a punch, they're so used to violence. They're expecting that that punch is going to land. Sure. Sure. When you move in on them, the moving in their reptile brain literally is all of a sudden screaming what's happening, what's happening. And they actually rock back on their heels because they, they, they just do not expect you ever to move in. They expect right. everyone to move back. And I don't know about you, but when I started karate, we were taught to move back a lot. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And yeah, you know, yeah. that was, that's yeah. very bad. And I yeah, see yeah. this still going on in Okinawa. Yeah. You know, yeah. and same yeah. thing in the dojo. We do, we do drills against multiple opponent stuff. Yeah. And yeah. I don't see that being done in Okinawa. And, you know, I don't see yeah. anything against weapons in Okinawa. Yeah. You know, we working against knife. We're doing gun disarms, club, baseball bat. I mean, I don't see any ground fighting being done in Okinawa anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, did, did you learn ground fighting in Gojiro? You know, when I started in Goju, 
30 odd years ago, we fought full contact all the time, all the way to the ground. So we, we, a good day was you got to wear teeth and those little tiny white back of the knuckle gloves, no groin protectors. You got kicked in the nuts, punched in the teeth. We went to the ground. I mean, there was really no rules. So when we, I was at a school for a while where like two days a week, it was Goju two days a week. It was Taekwondo. And and the Wednesday was fight night. Okay. And like we mopped the floor, our green belts mopped the floor with the Taekwondo guys every right. week over and right. over again. Cause, cause they were like, Oh, you can't punch us in the face. Like, Oh yeah. <laughs> like, right. It was just like, we always fought super hard. So at least for us, there was an influence of Peter Urban on Goju in the U S from an okay. early time. And so there was always a lot of hardcore fighting in Goju yeah. from, from the early days. So I don't, I'm not like that so much nowadays. I'm a lot. More well, I don't think it's healthy. Progressive. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not someone, I don't allow contact in the dojo knowing that it's going to happen sometimes because it's yeah. martial arts. It's like, I tell people you play tennis, you're going to twist an ankle, you play martial arts, you're going to get hit. You know, you well, do, when- you do Kobudo, you're going to get hit with a weapon. This is just going to okay. happen. But, yeah. but we're going to try not to have it happen. Exactly. Are you familiar with the book Karate Shortens Your Lifespan? I've heard of it. I haven't read it now. Yeah. It's, All right. Thanks. It's written by a couple of couple of doctors, and yeah, it's yeah. pretty it's pretty interesting. Yeah. And you know, McCarthy and I have had this uh, thing about karate. Is it's supposed to be holistic? And then when you look at some of its practices, it's right not too holistic, right? So yeah. I've tried to change yeah. my mindset in terms of that. Uh, yeah, I've gotten older trying yeah. to prevent people from causing the long time inflammation and damage yeah. to the body. Yeah. I see, you know, a lot of people, yeah. a lot of people doing to themselves, you know? Yeah. And, I, yeah. And, and just going back, like I know Tatsuo, Tatsuo taught ground fighting techniques to these Marines. Like he didn't do mm-hmm. a, have a lot of them, but you know, I, I see what he taught in terms of the, the, that brief curriculum when those Marines were there eight months to 13 months for mm-hmm. a tour. And, you know, he showed, he had like three to five knife defenses. He had, um, you know, five or six ground fighting defenses, which you uh, don't, you don't want a hundred techniques. Well, right. But you want, my, yeah. but my thing is, is like, I, I don't see that on Okinawa anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm never seeing an Okinawan sensei having a guy demonstrate, demonstrate a knife defense. I'm never seeing him on the floor with a guy on top of him showing right. like, okay, right. like why? Because yeah. they painted themselves into the box of sport. Mm, and that's why yeah. in the West now, in the West now, I think you'll find more people doing more practical mm. martial arts yeah. and looking to to bring these arts forward in a way where, you know, like you said, it's more principle based. Yeah. Based we still on- want to honor the traditions. Yeah, of right? course. We still need to honor the, the men who came before us, but you've got to honor them by tending the flame right yeah yeah well i had you know walter van gilson was a first generation student of tatsu shimbuku sadly he passed away two years ago and he uh he was really good and he he went back to okinawa and lived there and worked on a rice farm after he got out of the marines wow and he was actually teaching some of tatsuo's oh because you know there were separate classes there were okinawa yeah. only classes he was actually in some of those okinawa only classes oh cool and, and and so i got to hear about things that the other first generations either weren't willing to say or mm. never experienced sure, sure and uh you know so it's interesting hearing from his standpoint that there were two two different ways that he was teaching yeah, yeah. teaching the americans one way teaching the okinawans somewhat different and you know again we don't want to maybe like you talk about honoring the early guys, I think we should honor them because if without yeah. them, none of us are sitting here. We're not doing That's right. That, right. But That's like right. you said, we also need to say, okay, well, you know, those guys only learned X amount and okay. Is there more to it? Cause they're telling me to master this stuff is a lifetime. Okay. But I asked the guy who I first trained with and he tells me, just go hit the heavy bag to get more power. Well, there's gotta be more. It has right. to be more. It has to be yeah. details. Like the detail you gave the the lady about how to stand up yeah. with a bad knee. There are details that matter. And when, when I, I did a seminar and, and Walter Van Gilson showed up to the seminar, which I was floored. I was like, literally like, he, he walked in. I said, sensei, he says, Michael, how are you? I said, okay. Like, well, why are you here? He goes, well, you're teaching a seminar, right? 
And I looked at him like, like in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, but you're, you're Walter Van Gilson. I'm just Mike Calandra. Right. Yeah. And he goes, no, no, no. I want to, I want to see what you're teaching. I, I you know, I want to know what's going on here. So at the end of the day, he came up to me and really made me feel good. He goes, you know, you're doing what we all should have done, but we didn't. And which is you went back to the source. You went back to China. You, mm -hmm. you studied with these Chinese, you're studying with these Chinese masters now. Mm -hmm. And you're realizing that there's things in karate that it's not that they were lost. It's just that they kind of fell by the wayside because mm -hmm. of circumstances mm -hmm. like world yeah. war two, wh yeah. whatever. Right. I mean, yeah. and now you're, he said to me, you're bringing that back in to the Okinawan martial art. And he mm -hmm. goes, I'm looking at you and I'm like, like, wow this is what we should have done. Like we yeah. didn't realize we should have explored the Chinese side of things. Yeah. And you know, you could say what you want, right? <laughs> but like, I don't know how old five ancestor fist is. How, about 200 I, years old. Okay. So Chen, we know Chen style Taiji, we know 400 years in mm -hmm. terms of where we can verify it. Mm -hmm. Chen Zhanghua, myself, we probably think it's a little older than that, but let's say mm -hmm. 400 years, you know, I mean, 200 years, 400 years, we know karate is not as old as everybody right. would like to think it is. Right, right. It's just not. Not At least not the current styles, right? Those are all no, very modern 100, creations. 100%. And, you know, but we always hear China, China, China. And then we look at karate and I'm like, well, where's the China? You know, now I realize there's a lot of China there if you realize where it is and you emphasize it, right? Yeah. But, you know, so I think, yeah, you, you got to acknowledge that certain yeah. arts that are older had yeah. a lot of time to develop. Yeah. You know, I see this in, in, in some of the video clips that you post that I've watched. I can see how you teach your Ishinru now through the lens of your Tai Chi experience. 100%. And I don't think that's wrong. I think it's I think it's what you have to do to make sense of things in a way that makes sense to you. And if you develop a better way of describing something by using a, a, an example from Tai Chi, I think that makes sense. My goju now, I think a lot of people are like, oh, you're so Chinese or whatever. And I would tell you, I don't change the kata. I don't, right. add, I don't add new techniques. If I bring in a drill from Five Ancestor or White Crane, I tell you it's from there. Hey. But, but all of my teaching methodology is heavily influenced by my understanding of how Chinese martial arts are taught or how I learned them. Not, not that Chinese martial arts are a monolith and they're all taught the same way. They're not, right. but it dramatically influenced the way that I teach such that it's, here's a concept, here's an example, go play. Right. And if some people are so fucking serious about what they do, if you say the word play, oh, you, you get, well, they get all I, I use the word fun. I use the word fun, right? Like I literally, you know, I was asked by a senior teacher, why, why do you waste your time doing Kobudo? Yeah. And my response to him was, and not for nothing, he was ridiculously overweight, right? Oh. And I said to him, I said, well, two reasons. One, in Mariyoshi Kobudo, there's all these different weapons. I said, and every one requires different muscles. And I said, I'm jumping around and I'm doing this Mariyoshi Kobudo, swinging these weapons, and it keeps my body in pretty good shape. I said, but it's a lot of fun. Like and a it, lot of, and fun. it makes your karate better anyhow. And, and you know, so. you got to look at it from my standpoint. I'm a guy who, for 22 years, risked my life and engaged in more combat than any modern karate guy you know, right? And so I'm deadly serious on the self defense aspect. Yeah. And I'm a firm believer in it should be fun. Like yeah, training yeah. has to be fun too, because if it's not, totally, totally. It gets a little kind of. Totally. It just it, it's it. You know, there was there was. The first time we met, you said something, and I've actually held on to this. It was actually a really valuable little piece of uh, a little saying that you said. You said, for real self-defense, the, the one thing you really need is the mental ability to push your finger through somebody's eyeball. Yep. Everything else is extra. <laughs> Everything else is extra. And you know what? That really stuck with me because it's, it's a really valuable thing because I've had some young people come into the dojo and I'm a very progressive teacher. I start from the basics and work you into partner training. And I've had people who could not handle being held onto by the shoulders and shook a little bit. Yeah. People don't understand violence and or even the idea of replicating anything, even 
two percent close to being what violence really is. So yeah, I anyhow, I just thought I'd let you know. I thought that was um a very poignant thing you had to say. I've reused that and I give you credit for that. Well, I, I'll, I give, it, I'll so. give I'll give you two two examples. One, you know, I've had to stick my finger in many a person's eye, right? And you know, the one time I did it because a guy was refusing to be handcuffed and I just put my finger in his eye and I said to him, I said, if you don't put your hands behind your back, I'm going to take your eyeball out. Now, I wasn't going to take his eyeball out, but he believed I was going to take his eyeball out and he put his hands behind his back. And my my partner, who was like 6'2", 250, built like Arnold Schwarzenegger, says to me afterwards, I don't understand how you can do that. I don't understand how you can put just put your finger in somebody's eye. And I said to him, well, you better understand it because I may not be around all the time. And you you may get in a situation where the only way you're going to survive is by, and you know, and the Chinese have a saying, the eyes are the general of the body. Mm -hmm. You eliminate the eyes, you, you take out the body, right? Yeah. And I remember Master Chen Zhang Wow, when I was first going up to his events to train, the one year I go and some guy comes up to me, I didn't know. And he says, oh, he's so oh, you're a, you're my calendar, right? I says, yeah. I said, yeah. Hi, nice to meet you. He goes, yeah, I'm really looking forward to your lecture. And I looked at the guy and I said, uh, um, what lecture? And then I go find Chen Zhang Wan. And I said, Shifu, uh, I just ran into some guy. He says, I'm doing a lecture. Oh yeah. I forgot to tell you. He goes, you're doing a lecture on real martial art. I said, what do you mean? Like self-defense, like what actual combat, life and death combat's like. I gave that first lecture to a group of Taiji people. Now you got to realize, even in practical method, which is very about fighting, right? Mm -hmm. You still get a lot of, they want to hug trees. They want to yeah, feel sure. it, which great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember Master Chen sitting in the back as I gave this lecture and the looks on people's faces. Right. And him sitting in the back laughing. Because right. you're talking about violence and they're thinking about moving chi and body structure, right? <laughs> and and when I finished, like someone came up to me and said, go, wow, Mike, you've given me a lot to think about. Yeah. And again, I tell all the time, I, I don't want people to experience violence. On a, yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah. You but, might have to. And so, I, want, I want you to win. Yeah. So, you know, this reminds me of, um, I've had a lot of firearms training in my life. Um, I often carry a gun. I live in a state that's very gun friendly. I do too. Um, yeah, you're Florida, uh, right? I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, a, I'm Arizona. I'm a, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pretty decent shot. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, one of the things you have to do if you're ever going to carry a gun is envision scenarios that you may encounter where you may decide to pull a gun because you cannot decide that in the moment you have to pre-identify scenarios that are dangerous enough to warrant the risk of you going to prison for inappropriately brandishing your weapon hitting something in the background or killing somebody that was aimed on killing you and your family you still might go to prison so all these things have to be pre-considered. You cannot strap a gun on, go out in the public, and expect to make those decisions in the moment. So I think of it like your discussion about being mentally prepared to poke your finger in the eye. Um, one, one more related to this. Uh, one of my, one of my longest-term students went off to the army. He came back. He had studied army combatives. So he was all like, "Jujitsu is the best thing in the world." You, it's full, it's full resistance all the time. Nothing is as good, blah, blah, blah. So we, so we started going at it. Wrestling, guillotine. I have put me in a guillotine. I have to do top mount. I have to do all these things. And I reach up and I'm like, he's like, no, no, no. I can, I can squeeze hard enough. You can't poke my eyes out. I'm like, dude, I start putting some pressure on his eyes. Like, no, I think I, I'm like, dude, I'm not pushing on your eyes anymore. But just know that in a bunch of these positions where you don't have my arms locked, and I'm not saying that that training is not helpful. That training is very helpful. No, but, I'm never saying the, that. but the point is the eyes are very day, very weak. You cannot train them. As you know, in these arts, they are, they are a, a potential source of ability to defend yourself. Yeah, well, so. I, you know, I had, you got to, you know, again, 22 years as a police officer, I would get guys that would come in and the training officer, they they ask their training officer something, a rookie, and the, the training officer would say, go talk to Calandra. He's the martial arts guy. 
So they come and they say to me, you know, I've been doing Taekwondo for all these years and I tried to use some of the techniques. It's not working. You know, he goes, no, he says, I'm doing martial arts and it's not working. I said, well, martial art. He goes, Taekwondo. I said, well, it's not a martial art. And he goes, no, no, it's a martial art. I said, no, no, it's a martial sport. And I said, it's not a knock, but now you're not in the dojo. You're in the real world. Like you need to understand that a lot this of- This whole how you've never trained against a face punch, yeah. it's kind of important. Well, <laughs> especially since the face punch is the number one attack worldwide. Right? Worldwide. That's the most <laughs> common thing, right? So if you can't deal with that, and I tell Taiji people this all the time. Okay, like how often are you training against someone trying to punch you in the face? Well, no, no, we do a lot of the push hands, the wrestling push hands. Okay, that's great. But that's yeah. probably not what you're going to deal with. You're going to deal with someone trying to take your head off, right? And and again, this is the problem. And, and from a self-defense standpoint, like what you were talking about, one of the things I make sure I do in classes, when I teach a technique that is, let's say, more lethal, um, where it has a high likelihood as a, as a minimum, the person's going to be seriously hurt. Yeah. And I say to them, well, can, you know, can I, can I do this in this situation? And I'll give them the situation. So for instance, let's say I disarm the guy with the knife, right? And uh, he's on the ground, but he's not, he's incapacitated. He can't do anything. So I'll, I'll see someone in the dojo stab the guy while he's on the floor. Prison. I go, I go, okay, <laughs> time out. Let's, let's talk about this. Yeah. And you know, again, you know, the understanding of when, when and how you need to use these techniques. And like, you know, I'll, I'll demonstrate a technique and someone will say to my, say to me, my God, Sensei, if you did this, that to someone, you'd kill them. And I'd, I'm like, well, there may come a time where you have to take a life to save your life or to save someone else's life. And if you're thinking here right now, I could never do that. I look at one of the women and I say, you know, I point to, you know, I say, you have children, right? And they go, yeah. And I go, and they go, yeah, I'd 100% take a, take a life to save my child. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So it's, there's, that's an understanding that we may have to do that. But the key is, is once the person is incapacitated to the point where they're no longer a threat to you, now if you grab their head and start banging it on the floor multiple times, you're going to go to jail. Because you went from being the reasonable person who did a reasonable thing to right. being the person that became unreasonable you yeah. cross that line where now what you did was self-defense now what you're doing is criminal and i find in most martial arts school that discussion's not being had i find a lot of especially the more guys that are a little bit more macho and a lot of those instructors that are more macho you know usually i find out they've never had a real fight in their life mm -hmm. right oh you do this to the guy and you put him down and you finish him and you stomp him blah 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 okay well now you're just taught your student to do something that's probably exactly. gonna get, probably going to get them jail time. Yeah. And you know what's good with me is I have stories, not only my stories. I have other stories that I experienced from being a cop, where I'm like, you know, I I can illustrate it, um, yeah. and then when I tell it, you know, th their eyes get big, and I'm like, that guy lucked out, like they decided he was still in the right, but it could have gone either way yeah, to him yeah. in terms of a self-defense situation. Right. Right. And then yeah. of course you're all, almost always potentially open to a civil lawsuit, regardless of criminal. Yeah. Like so. I, I mean, I'm a member of the USCCA mm -hmm. yeah. because it has the self-defense insurance. Yes. It's a good idea. And I recommend it to everybody, you know, because yeah. again, it's not just, it's not just the firearm self-defense. Yeah. It's yeah. any self-defense situation. Yeah. yeah. It's you smart. Know? It's yeah, smart. I you're going to need, it, I, I mean, if you encounter law enforcement, through some self-defense situation, you are encountering law enforcement, you are encountering the legal system, you are likely to go through some very painful and expensive, expensive. process. Yeah. And you know, so, again, in myself, I have a lot of experience. Yeah. I know what to say. I know how to act. And I still have the insurance because- Stop, of stop, stop, drop the weapon. Yeah, because of the cost. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> of the cost, right? Yeah. You, get, you engage in those some type of self-defense lawsuit, you're looking at a lot of money. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And probably you're going to spend time in jail more than likely. Yeah. Well, you're, yeah, you're going to initially, right? Until, yeah. Yeah. Until you can again, post a bond. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's scary. These are, some, these are some of the things that, you know, besides teaching this stuff, yeah. um, some of the things that if you're going to teach it from a self-defense standpoint, I think it's incumbent upon every instructor to have some knowledge in those regards. Yeah. You know, like yeah. now being out in Arizona, I'm not as up on the Arizona laws. 
Sure. So, but my son's a Phoenix police officer. Oh, cool. So if a question comes up, I'll, you know, I, well, you have him come into the school and give a lecture. Or I I ask him, I say, Hey, what's the story with this and this? And he goes, no, no, dad, it's basically, it's very, it's pretty much the same as New York. It's, it's this, Mm. it's that. I go, okay. Yeah. It's force, uh, force continuum, justifiable level of force. Yeah. Those things. Right. Did you fear for your life? Yeah. These kinds of things, you know? But and, uh, so, oh, I don't know if they have castle doctrine there. Like, yeah, I don't you know, Florida sure years ago. Ca- I mean, Arizona is like, yeah, I think it's more like Florida in those, this respect. You know, when you get your concealed carry here, you can conceal carry all kinds of weapons. It's yeah. not just guns. Yeah. Yeah. In so, Florida, you know, they even, they went constitutional carry not yeah. long ago. Yeah. So you don't even need the CCW anymore. Yeah. You know, and for people in New York, it's hard for them to comprehend when you're walking around someplace where so many people are armed. But there's like my son said, my son's on eight and a half years. He says, I've never had an issue with a legal carry. Right. right. Well, all that's the, the thing, right? All the yeah. issues are predicate felons that are mm-hmm. gun prohibitive. Mm-hmm. Those are the guys we have issues with. We've right. never had an issue with right. a legal gun owner, a carrier yeah. that's allowed, you know, and that's totally. what people understand. And, you know, and I tell people, this is the same with martial arts, that when you're given, the, when you get these abilities and you get, you start to get pretty good you know, you've got to realize, okay, I got to, I got to not involve myself in bullshit over bullshit. Right. right. Like the guy, the guy giving me a look, you know, right. the guy saying something to me. Yeah. That's got to roll off you. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. The guy. Well, and, and another harm you different yeah. story. You yeah. Know? yeah. You know, another thing that I found over the course of my life is just generally the wonderful, one of the wonderful side effects of training in martial arts and developing the confidence through the the hard training is sometimes you you're getting close to a situation and your body language and your look can shut things down in a way that words are unnecessary. So I found this to be true in a lot of cases in my life where luckily things never got to that point just because people realize you're not a victim. You're not the right kind of victim. I I had things where I grabbed the criminal and he started to resist and I started, I immediately put him in a joint lock and he went, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> and he immediately put his hands behind his back. And then we nice. get to the command and I'm doing the paperwork and he's sitting there looking at him and he goes, I know who you are. <laughs> I kind of look at him. Oh. I go, man, who am I? You're that jujitsu guy. Uh, and I'm nice. like, what are you talking about? And he says, Oh, I saw you fight one of my, friends one of his criminal friends a few months before oh, and he wow. said he said he said my friend picked up his hands and i never saw anybody take someone out that fast right and he looked at me and he says i, I thought you looked familiar when you approached me and then when you <laughs> grabbed me and i started to resist i realized oh my god it's that guy he's having flashbacks which right. was good because i didn't have to do it i didn't have to hurt him right i didn't yeah. have to turn him into a pretzel yeah I, that that you know and and you say about the way you carry yourself you know in the beginning yeah. even you know you're learning and you're realizing like i tell people i i would go to put someone and try to get them in a joint lock because my goal is to handcuff them right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it would take maybe three or four techniques mm-hmm. then as i got more proficient boom one technique they were done but then what happened was the i don't know if you want to call it energy the presence Mm -hmm. like the criminal's a predator Mm -hmm. so he seeks out the weak one in the pack right 100 like the lion doesn't pick out the zebra that's snorting fire and shooting lightning no he looks the guy that's limping a little bit and goes that's the guy i'm gonna get right right and the predator does the same thing and in, in the case of the body language you know the predator reads it and says okay wait a second this is this is not. Yeah. Work. I want something easy, not yeah, hard. This is not, this is not going to go well. I better just kind of get with the program here. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I tell my students that, you know, eventually in the beginning, you're not going to have that presence, but eventually you're going to have that presence and that pre- yeah. presence can prevent a lot of problems. Yeah. You know, the guy in the parking lot who decides for whatever reason, you know, it's going to give you a hard time. And then you kind of look at him a certain way and he realizes, Oh, yeah. okay, maybe this, yeah. is, this is a mistake, you know, yeah. and that's you know, a back- thing. You know, back back to firearms for a second, like this data is not tracked, but among us who are well trained and paying attention to firearm related self-defense, there are a tremendous amount anecdotally 
of crimes deterred by by CCW holders brandishing a weapon and never having to use them. Now, those aren't typically reported that well, but and they don't certainly don't show up in news media as a good thing. So let me give you let me give you my experience. So I've never been in a shooting. Mm -hmm. okay, but I've disarmed guys with guns. okay, and I've taken a lot of guns off guys. Mm -hmm. I've been close. I've been to the point where I've taken all the slack out of the trigger. Because the guy yeah, was close. The guy had a gun in his hand. Yeah. And I was close. giving him directions. And, you know, so I, I literally had an ADA, an assistant district attorney, say to me, I would have shot him. Yeah. And my response was, You weren't there. And and I wasn't at the surprise break. Right. And, and my thing, <laughs> my thing was is yeah. is my one partner asked me one time, he got promoted to sergeant. So he was going on to bigger and better things. And he said, you know, with all the things we've been involved with, he says, why do you think we were never in a shooting? And I said to him, because we were always good enough. That's awesome. And he yeah. looked at me and I said, Heck yeah. so what I'm telling you is even as a cop, most cops are not involved in shootings. Right. But most cops have their guns out a lot, a lot. And at, it's a deterrent if, if right. at the very least. At the very least. And, you know, it's the same thing. It's like look, your body presence can be that mm -hmm. deterrent, mm -hmm. you know, your head on a swivel. The, the yeah. fact that you're not zombied around on your phone while you're walking through a quasi rough part of town. Like that's just suicide. Yeah. You know, but so you think how many more books? Well, there's going to be, I think, four small books this year and then I might be done. I don't know. We'll see. No, there. Well, there's one more project that I'm working on. That's a Chinese translation. There's a uh, there's an old book about 500 years old from China by a man by the name of Yu Da Yo. He okay. wrote a book called The Sword Classic. It's actually okay. I've heard of it. Now yep. that you say that, I've heard of it. Uh -huh. Yep. It's a book that um, he called it the Sword Classic, but he trained classically in sword, but he taught using a staff. Staff being a cheaper and easier weapon to to teach people on. So um, it's an interesting book. It has some great theory, which all very heavily influenced all of these arts. So actually, right. some of the some of the poems in this book actually come directly from Yudayo's writings. Okay. So um, anyhow, Yudayo's sword classic has some theory, a little bit of trident work, some tiger forks, uh, and then um, about 180 different fighting scenarios to demonstrate different oh, strategies and okay. tactics. So I'm trying to work my way through that. It's a little difficult. This stuff is very old, and as you're probably aware old fight books like German fight books and Bubishi and stuff. The language did, is different. And not only is the language different, some of the characters are very old and regionally used, but also the techniques aren't described because they're understood. Everybody right. in Germany knew how to wrestle. Right. So when you're, when you're teaching sword, you're not teaching how to wrestle. You're assuming they know that already. Right. Right. So some of these things are challenges, but that's a kind of a labor of love. I love the staff as a weapon. I've been applying a lot of the strategy and tactics to Mario Shikobodo, which just works perfectly. And um, yeah, it's interesting because studying the Katori Shinto rule like I do, which is, you know, nice 600 yeah. years old and never, yeah, never yeah. thought I'd get the opportunity to do that. You know, it's um, very cool. That's one of the things I find fascinating is the common threads that go through these combat arts. Yeah. Like if, if you're doing an art and the, that those common threads aren't there, you got to take a step back a little bit. Right. And for me, like, I don't see a lot of contradiction. Right. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure you're probably finding the same thing. You know, I do feeding yeah. crane and uh, you know, again, the the method of generating power to me is the same method as Tai Chi. Nice. And it should be the same method in karate, right? Oh, that's cool. It's yeah, used for body at a high level, right? Yeah. Yeah. For me, one of the most important things is is timing and understanding how an art understands and teaches timing as it relates to the maneuvers you know this is why i think it's fair to see that a lot of people say well block punch karate is like first grader level because it's it's actually divorced from combat timing for the purposes of developing body power and structure and coordination but the timing of any tr any art in its true method for application is significantly different because you have to have simultaneous defense and attack in in any art to make it actually combat effective. And the question is, how does your art do it? Right. For me, and I think like, and I think looking at the kata, a lot of the answers are there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the kata virtually never steps back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. 
it's almost always moving forward. The Tai Chi yeah. form is always moving forward. Yeah. Feeding, feeding crane is moving forward. Aggression. You have to and have aggression, right? The, so the five ants are fist stuff yeah. I've seen you do and other guys do. I'm like, yeah. oh, I don't yeah. see them really stepping back. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's, you know, and, and that's yeah. the difference I think. And, you know, I, I think there's a little bit of a change going on. I think you have now kind of two camps in the martial arts, um, which is the, I want to do this in its original method for self-defense, hoping I never have to use it, but that's how I'm going to train. I'm going to train as though this is real and it's going to be real. And this is more interesting. It's not, you know, it's not that, well, I'm going to score a point. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you got the guys that are doing it as pure sport mm -hmm. and they're doing martial arts as a sport. They're all only interested in competition. And, you know, God bless those guys. My one student in Ishin yeah. in London, that he's got a sport oriented Ishin Ru karate school. God bless yeah. him if that's what he wants to do. So long as we're all clear about everybody's goals, it's all good. We right. can all have different right. goals. But I, I think you have now guys really realizing and trying to look for the principles. Yeah. And look for, well, how do those principles help my art? Yeah. Like, okay, the, what I was initially shown was great, but now is there- How do more? I make it work? And how do I train it? How do I more. make it work? Right. Yeah. You know? So yeah. so again, I'm going to hold up these three books. Oh, thank you. So, my favorite- that's cool. I, I it's a small translation of a of a twenpu, which is like the bubishi. It comes from around the same place. That was the first one. Thank you. If you're a new instructor, please read this. Please don't make the mistakes that the rest of us had to make to get to where we are now. And if you're an uh, an older instructor like myself, it'll still give you a lot of food for thought and things to think about. Thank you so much. And this one we didn't really talk about, right? The yeah. Box, the Manual for Five Answer for Fist, Volume 1, right? Which yeah, this... Again, I, I liked it a lot. There's just, again, you know, for me, I don't have to study the art, but I can read certain things and I'm just like, oh yeah, I like that. Oh yeah, oh, well yeah, you know, that's yeah. something I can, you know, mention or something I can, oh yeah, that applies, that applies and yeah. this I do and that I do, you know. That's why I think sometimes, I think guys need to expand their minds a little bit and look to read some books that are way outside of their so-called comfort zones. You know, sense. Yeah. Um, you know, and realize that there's a lot of good stuff out there and the book doesn't have to necessarily be a how to book. Right. You know, it can be a book that, you know, makes this expand a little bit, makes you yeah. think about the principles they're talking about there. Right. Yeah. And how can I bring that into my martial art? Yeah. I learned, you know, at this stage of my life, I learned few, few tricks or techniques or, or kata that really change my training. But sometimes I learn a phrase or an idea or a different word to use for something I used to say. And it just makes it better. It's just incrementally better, but it's actually super valuable. So yeah. I thank you for that yeah. and yeah, appreciate a, the opportunity. Yeah. yeah, it's been great. And uh, we should do this again. Sounds good. And, uh, you know, I might reach out to you about that software. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I definitely will give you... Um, it, it, you know, I'll it's help like you understand it, how I'm it, working through it. It's like my channel. You know, when I got out here, uh, I'll just mention this. And, uh, you know, someone suggested I do the podcast. And I thought they were out of their mind. And I literally was like, you know, it was my first partner as a cop. And okay. he was one of my students, too. I hadn't spoke to him in years. He called me. He says, you should do a podcast. He says, nobody nobody in martial arts has your, your real fighting experience. And he says... Uh, you know, there's a lot, you know, you should, you, and I, so I, I initially, I thought about it for about a month, maybe a little longer. And then I bought a mic and I attached the mic to the desk and I just left it there. And right. I, <laughs> my wife comes out and goes, what's that? And I says, ah, I'm going to report. I'm some trying stuff. something out. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to think, you know, and about a month or two later, I started thinking about well, what's a, what's, what could I call it? And I came up with the martial truth, right? Yeah. You know, people ask me, how'd you come up with that name? I said, I just was bouncing around things. It came up. I said, oh, you know, that'll be a good one, right? I'll speak the truth to martial arts. And then I had to come up with a first podcast, which was, you know, who are you training to fight? 
Right. Are you trained to fight a Gracie Jiu Jitsu guy? Because that's not the guy who's going to try to hurt you for real. Are you trained to fight a karate guy? Well, I want to be, be able to beat a, a Kyokushin guy. Okay, but no Kyokushin guys. I never took a report where they said, yeah, the guy knew karate and he used that to rob me. Right. So, you know, that it's was, like the legal CCW guys. Those right. aren't the guys doing the crimes. Right. And I, I watch him a call it. I, you know, so I started there and then, you know, it kind of went off and it's slowly building, but the channel, yeah. the channel now just passed 13,000 subscribers. Awesome. Which is a lot for a little yeah. martial arts channel. And uh, congratulations. You know, pe people seem to like the podcast. Like I've been yeah. mentioning that I'm going to be interviewing you. I mentioned it to someone mm -hmm. else today. They were like, oh, that'll be really good. So, yeah, so cool. I appreciate you coming on. I, I really appreciate the do. opportunity. Thank you and, very much. Uh, you know, hopefully uh, we can do this again in the future. Sounds yeah. good. Let me know. All right. Hope you enjoyed the interview with uh, Russ Smith. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. It was great talking to him. Um, we're hoping in the near future to have uh, Andreas Quast on the podcast for an interview. He's just written a book on the bow, and he's written many other books, including Karate 1.0. He's translated one of the Motobu books, several other books that are outstanding martial arts books, so hoping to get him on in the very near future. All right? Once again, can't recommend these books enough. All right? Um, all three of them are excellent. All right? um, again, if you're an instructor, this one's a must-have. Um, definitely go out and get it okay um it's important we support people that are doing good things with martial arts so they can continue doing more good things with martial arts all right again i hope you've enjoyed this one i did um please click the like button share uh subscribe all right just past thirteen thousand. all right and uh think about becoming a member supporting the channel and we can do more things like this and hopefully uh more things down the road all right um thanks again appreciate all of you and i'll see you in the next one take care